and ham. Welcome to Apologia and another edition of Ham and Egg News, where we react to Ken Ham reacting to things. I wasn't aware we were going to jump the gun to have a Halloween episode so early. Otherwise, I'd have found a costume. Instead, you just get what I was wearing anyhow. You ready, Jeremy? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, just give us a countdown. All right. Ken's talking to his son, Jeremy Ham, the social media director for Answers in Genesis. In that capacity, Jeremy had an impact on me last week as he blocked me from Ken Ham's Twitter account for my nasty tweet, There Goes the Neighborhood. But more on that later. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Welcome to Answers News. It's Thursday, October 12, 2017. This article I saw this morning by an atheist on an atheist website, Creationist Ken Ham plans to ruin Halloween. Ruin it. I am, and it's all your fault. I'm incredibly dangerous. <laughs> I'm so powerful, I can ruin Halloween for the whole of America. Ken, you ruin a lot of things for a lot of people. Halloween is the tip of the iceberg. In a new blog, Ham implores his supporters to think about sharing Christ with trick-or-treaters. Of course, this isn't a new idea. That is brand new information! <laughs> for decades, Christian families have handed out religious pamphlets when the kids come to the door. For most kids, that's just part of sorting out the good stuff from the bad stuff. Like a fistful of candy corn or an apple or something. It's more of a downer than ruining things. And then the headline is, he's going to ruin Halloween. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that, that Jesus said to take the gospel into all the world anyway already. Right. You know, one of the things it says in here is, in particular, Ham recommends giving kids a copy of a booklet called A Biblical and Historical Look at Halloween. There's also a DVD, Halloween Paganism in the Bible. You know what's interesting about that? I did both of those. And you get the blame. This is brilliant. I get the blame for everything. <laughs> I'm no expert in psychology or in reading people, but I get the sense here that Bodhi isn't being genuine. I think Bodhi had his feelings hurt that he made the booklet and the DVD and that Ken is getting all the credit. And what exactly is in this booklet that is sure to delight children beyond that which candy is able? Halloween, Paganism, and the Bible. That title alone is sure to capture imaginations away from the great pumpkin. If it lines up with Bodhi's article on the Answers in Genesis website, it will begin with some of the more established facts about Halloween, like originating with the Celtic ghost deterrent festival called Samhain, then fast forwarding to the 8th century when Pope Gregory established November 1st as All Saints Day, incorporating some of the Samhain traditions. But then... Bodhi takes a huge leap. It is significant to note how many cultures around the world have celebrated a Day of the Dead, often with sacrifices, occurring at the end of the summer or fall. There seem to be too many parallels to call these celebrations a coincidence. And just how many parallels between holidays is too many to make a coincidence? Are Christmas and Hanukkah and Kwanzaa all the same holiday because of parallels? Having now linked any world festival remotely related to death together, he asserts that this must mean that the holidays share a single origin when all of humanity lived in one place and then dispersed. You guessed it, his personal pet project, the Tower of Babel. With a ministry called Answers in Genesis, they just have to drag everything back to Genesis, including, apparently, Halloween. What sort of Halloween costumes do you think they'll... Hey, you know what? We should come up with a Ken Ham costume. That's pretty disturbing but not quite as disturbing as the inevitable sexy Ken Ham costume. That's what we that would do. scare atheists everywhere. Kids knocking the door, trick or treat, Ken Ham! I'm going to be using this clip for years and years. I just wanted to let you know, I'm going to do all I can to ruin Halloween now. <laughs> Thanks to an attraction, and they're talking about the Ark, mm -hmm. thanks to an attraction of biblical proportions, a deep religious heritage, and a tradition of hospitality, Kentucky has surged to become the leading faith-based travel destination in the, in the country. And they say it it's actually the fastest growing yeah. faith-based destination. Fastest growing faith-based destination in the United States. That's nine words. I guess it checks out. I have a personal rule that any record that takes more than ten words to describe, then it's not really a record. Like... Most number of watermelons sliced open on someone's stomach in one minute, which is apparently 48. But this made me curious. What are the other attractions that the Ark managed to beat out for this prestigious honor? There's the Billy Graham Library, which is a library in the shape of a dairy barn. The Holy Land experience in Orlando, Florida, with a replica of Jerusalem, the Dead Sea Caves, and the Tabernacle. Sounds fun. The Crystal Cathedral, which is a church of over 10,000 people, and the same number of panes of glass and Christ in the Smokies, where the people of Gatlinburg, Tennessee, have posed mannequins 
like they are in scenes from the Bible. Keep pushing that envelope, Ken. Watch your back. Hey, we've had a great studio audience there from all across America. Anyone from a different country here? Um, I know. Yeah, yeah what country are you from? Canada. From Canada. Is that a different oh. country? It is, to the north, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Canada, the country where I live, a number of you wrote me to ask about the announcement of the formation of Answers in Genesis Canada in 2018. I've talked before about the formation of Answers in Genesis Australia, which is basically a glorified warehouse across the border to save on shipping costs. The Canadian version seems like it's going to be the same thing. I don't expect a Canadian arc anytime soon. But I was disheartened to see that it will be led by Calvin Smith, one of the dynamic duo of buffoons that host the Creation Today-like TV show called Creation Magazine Live. I've thought about tackling the show here at Apologia, as it's wall-to-wall -wall ridiculous creation claims at soaring new levels. But if you're wondering about the treat that Canada is in for, here's a clip of Calvin's typical eloquence and intellectual insight. So there's, a, uh, I guess, a statement that would really sum this up, right? That's right. It's, it's what we see in God's word it agrees with what we see in God's world. There is no, uh, you know, yeah. discrepancy here. It, it's it, just interpret the information according to God's word. It makes sense. And here's why Calvin was really chosen. Because really it's the resources that actually do it, the equipping. It is. So pick right. yourselves uh, up a, 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 you know, a subscription to Creation Magazine. Get an answers book, the top 60 questions. I think answers book should just be on every Christian's shelf at home. It's kind of right? on the must-read list, the yeah, must-read shelf. You should yeah. just have it. If this Canada Endeavor is just the store, then this book peddler seems up to the task. Science Magazine says, I don't care what they say about me. Paleontologist stares down critics in her hunt for dinosaur proteins. This was a really interesting kind of behind-the-scenes mm -hmm. article about Mary Schweitzer. If you've been following Paul Gia for a while, you'll know that whenever Dr. Schweitzer is brought up, I go back to a hangout I was in with her back in January on Steve McRae's channel. Morning, Dr. Schweitzer. Morning. What the creationists have to say doesn't seem to vary much, so it seems I'll need to do it again. Basically most well known for her discovery of um, soft tissue in supposedly millions of year old dinosaurs. That's You've got that supposedly in the wrong place, Georgia. It's supposedly soft, not supposedly old. It's a pity that scientists don't consider how their work will be twisted by creationists when they communicate to the general public about their findings. Right. Yeah, Dr. Schweitzer, she did a lot of this work. It was published back in 2007 originally, and she received a lot of criticism. The only threat I ever got, or the only times I ever felt threatened or whatever, were actually from emails I got from young earth creationists. So they did something nobody had done before. They took it and actually broke it in half. They loaded it on there, they take right. it back to the lab, and they zoom up right where they busted this thing apart. And uh, lo and behold, they started to discover some, some soft tissue. Um, they even found some veins. Um, it, it depends on how you define it. What is a blood vessel? How do you characterize a blood vessel? How do we know what we have? So if a blood vessel is made up of endothelial cells, if a blood vessel is, I mean, we've got, we know how to recognize modern blood vessels. Is it different? Yes, it's different. And that's what I mean. Words are really, really important. Do we have blood cells? No, we do not have blood cells. I don't have the data to support that. We have round red structures that localize to the blood vessel channels. They have the morphological characteristics of blood vessels. They have a chemical makeup similar to what you'd expect blood vessels, to have, blood cells to have. So the article kind of goes behind the scenes because Mary Schweitzer has received a lot of criticism for this. In fact, people have tried to really, other scientists have tried to say that her findings aren't legitimate. Scientists don't change their mind easily. So we, you know, it's been over 10 years since we announced these soft tissues and we still got a large contingent of the scientific community that doesn't buy it. But as more and more people apply these methods, they see that there's a lot of dinosaur bone out there that has soft tissues that are still soft, that are still flexible. So I would say right away, the scientific community, not the young earth community, had the very appropriate response, which is total skepticism. I'm going to wait and see what the data say. You know, it, it's fascinating to look at the life of Dr. Schweitzer right. mm -hmm. and uh, what, what she's gone through. Um, for those of you who don't know, she's uh, involved in paleontology. Uh, that's kind of her background. She's worked with Jack Horner, who's a fa very famous atheist, by the way. And, uh, and it, paleontology. And a pale <laughs> yeah, in paleontology, of course. Jack Horner is really known only as a paleontologist, not as an atheist. He's best known as the technical advisor for all the Jurassic Park films and as partial inspiration for the character of Dr. Grant. But a famous atheist? Try to find Jack Horner making any public comment on the existence of God. You will not find it. Apparently, uh, Mary Schweitzer has a little bit of a Christian background in there. Right. And uh, when she took the class, uh, you know, or I, I don't know if she was going to monitor the class or what she was going to do, but uh, she told Dr. Horner that she was a young earth creationist. Right. And he's like, well, I'm an atheist. And, uh, you know, it wasn't long and uh, she'd actually given up her views on uh, Christianity. I don't know what you mean by give up her views, but Dr. Schweitzer was never a young earth creationist. 
Like most Christians around the world, she's always been a theistic evolutionist. Essentially, at least for, well, for at least as far as a- origins, elements. yeah, concerned. origins, and, and adopted you know the, the pagan view there. But uh, it's interesting. She says here he just laid out the evidence, uh, but what, what she needed to understand was she laid, he laid it out from an atheistic perspective. One of the best pieces of inform- uh, advice I ever got for my career did come from Jack, and he said, "Prove to me they're not." This is what I showed him, and he said, "So what do you think they are?" And I said, "Well, they're in the right size, right shape, right whatever." but they can't be red blood cells. And he said, well, why not? And I said, well, because everyone knows they don't persist over this length of time. And he said, so prove to me they're not. And what that does is it takes my own personal bias out of, well, reduces my own personal bias because I'm trying to disprove my favorite idea. And so rather than trying to prove something in spite of the facts, you try to disprove using data and only data. And if you can't do it, it still stands. You see, we all have the same evidence. Most people don't realize that. That's the thing I think a lot of people don't understand is that it is the role of a scientist to disprove, not to prove. If you're doing science correctly, you are never going to prove anything. That's the job of mathematicians. I've had people say, well, where's the evidence, you know, for creation? What's well, the same evidence everybody else has? Right. Creationists and evolutionists, we all share the same evidence. We're looking at the same dinosaur bones, looking at the same DNA. We're looking at the same rock layer, same, same stars. We're looking at the same evidence. The difference is the interpretation. See, as a Christian, I want to start with the Word of God when I look at any piece of evidence. Mm-hmm. Now, the difference is, let's say an atheist is looking at the same evidence. They're leaving God out of it. They're leaving the Bible out right. of it. And that's the way they're looking at evidence. So it's a battle over two different religions. When I wear my science hat, I don't have beliefs. I have only data. It's very boring. (laughs) Data can only do two things. It can either support or fail to support. So we're not shocked that these types of structures, it's still surprising, but not totally shocking. Um, It's it's much easier to explain within a thousand year old, a few thousand year old's perspective versus a few million, lots of millions of years. Um, It just doesn't work. If we quit wasting time on how old these things are and start getting at why are they there, It has huge implications that go far beyond dinosaurs. So she's found this in multiple dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Um, She's found collagen, which is the main protein in uh, bone. You're impressed that the protein that makes bones was found in some bones? Collagen is a real robust molecule. It kind of hangs out for a long time under normal circumstances. So in bone, it's orders of magnitude more lasting. She's found what looks like hemoglobin, which is the protein in red blood cells. I don't know what those red things are because I don't have the data to say. The proteins that are there showing the osteocytes, which are the bone cells that are very much intact. And I've never figured out why people are more focused on these little red blood cells than they are on the osteocytes, which are way cooler. It's funny how creationists like to tout that osteocytes were found but ignore the test that was used to confirm that the cells were osteocytes. But with osteocytes, they're so, um, they're so unique that osteocytes actually produce some proteins that only osteocytes of birds produce, for example. And that's exactly what Mary's team found. They couldn't get the suspected T-Rex osteocytes to bind with modern reptile proteomes, but they did have success with proteomes of ostriches, supporting the conclusions that T-Rexes had more in common with modern birds than modern reptiles. You know, that's a big deal. I've heard, had a lot of people say, well, carbon-14, that proves millions of years, right? No, actually it doesn't. Uh, when somebody says that, it goes to show they really don't know much about carbon-14. And all radiometric dating is not equivalent. So I get a lot of people saying, well, why haven't you done carbon-14 dating? You know, there's a reason for that. And so, you know, I, I, I guess you have to be certain that the isotopes you're looking at are appropriate for the questions you are asked. Right. Carbon-14 can only give dates of thousands of years. In fact, theoretically, after about 50 to 100,000 years, there should be no carbon-14 left. So now think about this. We find dinosaur bones that have carbon-14 in it. So how is it that they could be 60 to 70 right. million years old while at the same time have carbon-14 in it? Google Scholar finds exactly zero peer-reviewed papers demonstrating a single instance of confirmed carbon-14 found in a dinosaur bone. The only place I could find this claim is a 2015 paper by the Creation Research Society. The abstract notes that secularists, a label which should have no meaning when presenting science, say the findings in question originate from systematic contamination, but the paper merely begs that the hypothesis of endogenous radiocarbonation should be considered. To repeat, there are no instances of carbon-14 in a dinosaur bone that isn't attributed to contamination. Absolute dating is based upon radiometric decay. You know, it's physics, it's inviable, it is one of those laws that's really hard to get around. But again, people are are very much up against her, um, even within her own scientific community. And see, for me, when people say, don't you get upset when your scientific community says this kind of stuff about you? I'm like, no, that is their job. And you know, there's always scientists out there 
trust me, who are a lot smarter than me, who think about things that I don't think about, and maybe I miss something. That's their job. And so they keep me honest. They keep me disciplined. They keep me hardworking. Um, but in the end, if my data is good enough, are good enough, if my data are rigorous enough, if my data are repeatable enough, they can have their minds changed. And that is science. It isn't faith. That's science. Absolutely. When I wear my science hat, I don't have beliefs. I have only data. You know, she basically switched worldviews, you know, when, with right. regards to origins. She went from a, a Christian origins worldview, and basically rejected the biblical worldview, and bought into evolution. Mm -hmm. You know, that would include the Big Bang, the millions of years, and so forth. It's not this big cloudy mystery that scientists are just sitting in their lab trying to figure out how to destroy Christian faith. I am a Christian. I love the Lord. And I have absolutely... I, I, my God has gotten so much bigger the bigger I study science. I mean, it's just it's really, really amazing. And I don't want to waste time on other, other issues like how old is the earth. I mean, really, who cares? Now, you know, I, I look at that and I just say, hold on a second. A God who isn't powerful enough to create in six days right. now uh, or tell the truth about what he did in Origins? I mean, mm -hmm. to me, that's not a bigger God. That's, that's a, a lesser God. God. That bugs me. Why would God try to trick us? Why that's would really you? demeaning. It's like, okay, we're going to give you a brain and we're going to make a... A world of order, because order is something God's known for. He's rational. He's consistent. So we're going to make this world of order, and then, wow, we're going to trick you by saying that all the, the rules that you can figure out with your brain no longer apply. God's not the deceiver in this. It, it saddens me to see that sort of thing. But. And I think that young earth creationists have to be really, really careful when they sit there and try to manipulate the data to support their worldview. That is not science. I mean, even Dr. Schweitzer was in right. shock. You know, like, there, there's no way this kind of stuff would yeah. possibly last 65 million years mm -hmm. or 70 million years, or whatever they were putting the data on. But you know what their response finally was, was, well, I guess this stuff really does last 65 yeah. million years or so. Yeah. You know, I get really frustrated sometimes because there's so many things that are so much more important than this. And it's like, they're, 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 they're stubbing their toe on a toenail. And there's so many things that this energy could be used to a greater good. And I think, again, tripping on this stupid little issue does not in any way honor God. What are they trying to do? I, it, it bugs me. Uh, it really bugs me. And you know what? When we just step back and think biblically about these things, having them buried in flood sediment, which occurred about 4,350 mm -hmm. years ago or so, not a big deal. If these guys would take half the energy that they spend trying to prove that the world is young and use it to change the world around them, feed the hungry, take care of the kids, get the cats off the street, anything, that our world would be so much better. But they waste so much time and energy and effort on disproving that the world is old. It's not a salvation issue. Get over it. Thanks again, Mary. I'll link to that full hangout in the description. And keep sending those emojis across the screen. More. Okay, we're getting a good number of them, but that really helps the reach of this particular new show mm -hmm. to get out there. And we definitely want it to get out there. Viewer emojis for a live stream doesn't help to get it out there like you think it does. No number of thumbs will put a Facebook video into the feed of someone who doesn't already subscribe to the account posting the video. Just like your entire ministry, all your efforts are geared to preaching to those who already agree with you. If you definitely wanted to get the word out there, you wouldn't social media block everyone who disagrees. Like you did to me, Jeremy. You little punk. Okay, do that. All right. Eins, zwei, drei. Oh, we got heard some people okay. out there. That thank have... you. Thank you for being all right, with us today. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Signing off. All right. That's all for this episode. But I'm thrilled to finally make the long overdue introduction of Shannon Q as my partner in the Apologia channel. For months now, she's been instrumental in research, righteous outrage, media gathering, and some of your favorite jokes that I've just been passing off as my own. Follow her on Twitter at Chan underscore Q0 to show her appreciation and watch her dice whatever pseudoscience proponents haven't blocked her yet. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel to be notified when new ham and egg and science claim videos are posted. If you're already subscribed, maybe share this video with someone else who would enjoy it. Or better yet, not enjoy it, but find the content challenging. Once again, a huge thank you to all my Patreon supporters who've been instrumental in increasing the quality and quantity of the videos on this channel. If you're willing to join them on Team Pologia, please check out the link in the description. Thanks everyone for watching. Until next time, later.